So what is autism? This is one of the first things families will ask when we start talking about a diagnosis. Fortunately or unfortunately, autism awareness has increased tremendously in the media. This can be good and bad. The good part of it is that we're diagnosing children at a younger and younger age, and the one thing that we know that works for treatment of autism is early intervention. Some of the negatives of this increased awareness of autism is that there's a lot of misinformation. In the media, everyone who knows someone with autism thinks that they're an expert, and some of this misinformation causes a lot of confusion for parents. What I hope to do in the first part of this video is to demystify the diagnosis of autism a little bit. Step back, look at the primary features of autism, how we make, make the, the diagnosis, and take some of the emotionality out of it. The current diagnostic criteria for autism are based on the DSM-4 uh, criteria. This is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. We look at three specific areas, the quality of the social interactions, the quality of the communication, and then having any restricted interests and repetitive behaviors. Let me start off by talking about that first area a little bit, the quality of the social interactions. Now a lot of this is dependent on age, and this is emphasized more in the new proposed diagnostic criteria for autism. But some things that parents might notice uh, early on that their children have who are concerns of autism is decreased eye contact. Uh, they'll, maybe the children will just prefer not to make eye contact with um, individuals, or at times may have what we call gaze aversion. That's where children are actively looking away, uh, doing everything they can to avoid eye, eye contact with others. Response to name being called uh, is another uh, uh, part of the social development that's concerning for parents. Some parents may say, you know, I say my child's name over and over. I may even say it to the point where I wonder if they're hard of hearing because they never seem to respond to their name. Uh, then they do hearing tests and maybe end up with uh, tubes in their ears and other um, um, uh, testing for hearing to find that it was probably just um, an impairment in their social development. On into older kids, we look for things like parallel play at an appropriate age, uh, interactive play, and then on into older school age kids, we'll talk about things like do they know how to make friends? Do they understand the difference between a friend and a bully, or even a friend and a classmate? And so it's one of the things I talk about in, in the office a lot is uh, when, I'm, when I'm talking to children is, uh, who's your friend and what's the difference between your friend and say just some other kid in, kid in your class? What's a bully? What do, you, uh, what do you do when people bother you or bully you at, at school? These all uh, uh, questions give me insight into the child's social development. Uh, the other thing too is lack of emotional reciprocity and that's something that's part of the diagnostic criteria. That is, how does a child respond emotionally um, to situations that come up? Do they have empathy? Are they em empathetic when someone's hurt? Do they think it's funny or are they empathetic at that? When you try to express emotions uh, such as uh, tenderness and compassion, how does the child respond to it? The second area in the Diagnostics and Statistics Manual in talking about autism is the quality of the communication. Now this can look different in different children also. It can look like a child who just has language delay. And some children with autism are essentially mute and, and don't say anything hardly. Uh, to children who may have a lot of words uh, coming out of their mouth, uh, they're just not meaningful. So the point of this is uh, the quality of the communication. There's also pathological speech. This is where children have echolalia, which is repeating either what they say um, or what an adult says, often with a similar intonation, or scripted speech, where a child may recite um, a text from a movie or, um, or a TV show or, or something that they read word for word. I'll often have families say, you know, they'll hear their child talking, they'll be very excited, their, their child is finally talking, but what's coming out of their mouth is a lot of scripted speech uh, from TV shows um, or, or books. Um, so the, the presentation of the, the language delay, the Im, important is that it's the quality of the communication, not necessarily um, is the child uh, speaking, but what's the quality? Is, do their words actually mean something uh, to, to communicate? The third area is looking at repetitive behaviors and restricted interests. This is one of the classic things that uh, most people know. Children with autism tend to have repetitive behaviors. This can look like hand flapping, rocking, spinning, 
uh, finger twirling up near the mouth, finger twirling uh, in, in, in the hair, um, other sort of uh, visual things where they may uh, move objects in front of, in front of, in front of their face, um, looking at things, things askew, uh, these sort of repetitive behaviors. Other parents uh, report as part of the diagnostic criteria uh, in, the, in this area, uh, lining up toys, uh, being sorting and uh, organizing rather than playing with their toys appropriately. Sometimes I'll have parents come in the office and I'll say, well, what does your child like to play with at, at home? And they'll say trains. And, and I think, okay, that could be good. It could, could be, be bad. How do they play with the trains? So if the parents say, oh, they just make the absolute longest train they can, they put them in perfect order from, say, the largest train or maybe even sort them by spe specific colors, um, and they drive them perfectly and like to watch the wheel spin. Well, that's not an appropriate way uh, to play with trains, depending on, on the, the, the child's age. What I like to hear is when parents say, oh, my child enjoys playing with uh, trains, and, and they'll say, you know, they, they, they like to have, you know, uh, this, this, this train who's maybe a, a good guy, and then uh, this, this other train that uh, uh, maybe likes to hide from some other trains, and they have in, in interactive scenes and stories which are different and changing, uh, but there's some sort of interactive play uh, with these toys that they have. In this third category, and this is in the DSM-4 criteria, which is going to change here uh, uh, soon, um, I think of a lot of abnormal sensory responses. So it's not specifically stated here, uh, but this is usually where when I'm talking to families in a, a, child, uh, a child's abnormal sensory responses, I often consider it as part of this third area. And this can be behaviors uh, like covering their ears for loud noises, um, other things like rocking and spinning may have a sensory uh, sort of component to it. Looking at objects, objects askew. Uh, these can all be um, a part of this um, third area. Rigidity, difficulty with transitions. One thing that we end up talking about in the office quite a bit is this difference of preferred and non-preferred activities. And the difficulty with the transitions between a preferred and a non-preferred activity. So for example, um, a child who enjoys, say, playing with that uh, train set, um, the parents will often say, you know, if we get him, um, try to get him off of playing with his trains before he's acted out a specific scene or until he's gotten the train lined up just perfectly, he'll have a meltdown, a bad behavioral uh, sort of response. Uh, this tells me that, okay, there might be some difficulty with transitions. When we eat, they have to eat off of a cert certain plate, and when we transition them out of, or off of that plate or to a different sip sippy cup, the child has a meltdown or, or some very bad behaviors, uh, oppositionality, explosive behavior. Uh, there's a couple other caveats um, in the diagnosis of autism. We look at those three specific areas. We just need to make sure there's not any autism mimicking conditions, things that can look like autism, genetic, general, meta, uh, genetic, general medical conditions, uh, maybe metabolic disorders. Um, and, and so that's the criteria that, as professionals, we look at to make a diagnosis. What I'm going to talk about now are some proposed changes to the diagnostic criteria, and that'll be coming up in the next chapter.